Here's number one. <coughs> Five minutes. So again, remember this is just a, a, a segment from a presentation. Imagine the whole presentation lasting about 30 minutes, and this is about a five-minute segment from it. And, and I picked, for my segment, I picked a Bible segment just because that's the part I'm most natural at. I tend to um, maybe put too much Bible in sometimes and not tell enough stories from the first few. But the Bible is the part that I find easiest. So here goes my five minutes. How shall we respond then to the persecuted church? We don't have to conjecture. The Bible contains an amazing amount of writings to persecuted believers and from persecuted believers. These writings provide wonderful guidance for us in how we should relate to them. Let me just take you to one passage. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. It says, Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak but that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. Now note carefully from this passage, where was Paul when he wrote these words? He was in chains. And these chains make Paul's prayer even more amazing. First note that Paul requests prayer, or excuse me, first note that Paul needs prayer. Being a super apostle doesn't mean that everything goes well for him just on autopilot. Even the greatest Christian has to stay on his knees. Sometimes I fall into the trap of thinking, oh, if only I were like these persecuted believers, then I would have just this wonderful relationship with God. But persecution is not the path to godliness. Godliness is the path to persecution, and prayer is the path to godliness. Secondly, Paul asks others for prayer. He doesn't believe his own prayers for himself are sufficient. If a superman like Paul needs prayers of others, how much more do we need to open up and ask? In fact, we find the first request of persecuted believers before food or medical care or Bibles is just pray for us. Thirdly, what does Paul ask for? Boldness. This is probably the last thing we think Paul needs. Boldness is what got him in jail in the first place, and now he's asking for more? This is because boldness in sharing the gospel is always a gift from God, not a matter of personality or temperament. Some personalities are naturally easy in a crowd, but no one is naturally at ease sharing the cross with unbelievers. Paul knows that he had, has no more strength without prayer than Samson had without hair. It's easy to assume that a believer who has shown great courage under pressure will never falter, but it's our prayers, the breath of our prayers, that provides the oxygen for their spiritual muscles. Fourth, notice that Paul requests boldness to proclaim a particular message, the gospel. The gospel is the most important message to proclaim because only by it can rebels be reconciled to, go to the God that they have flaunted. The gospel is also the most dangerous message to proclaim. No one likes to hear that they deserve hell, much less that they can't pull themselves out of hell by the, boots, the bootstraps of their own good works. Our society still tolerates this kind of talk, barely. But go to a society that's, a fading Christi that's not a fading Christianity like ours, but a vibrant Hinduism or Islam or atheism or Buddhism, and the reaction to the gospel will be violent. No wonder that Paul and the persecuted church want prayer. Fifth, isn't it amazing that Paul doesn't ask them to pray for his release? He asked for the opening of his mouth, but not the opening of his cell. What a proper sense of priorities he has. Indeed, our brothers and sisters around the world put us to shame in this regard. Unlike a health problem, which we can't simply just choose to escape when we want to, most of our brothers and sisters could instantly end the pain of their persecution by simply renouncing Jesus, or even just by simply ceasing evangelism. Six, look at that phrase, ambassador in chains. It seems almost an oxymoron. When we think ambassador, we think three-piece suit, nice haircut, handsome face. But God clothes his ambassadors in chains. We tend to wrestle against our chains and tell God that after he removes them, then we'll be his ambassadors. The persecuted church cannot wait for freedom to evangelize. <clears throat> Seventh, notice that the gospel should be spoken in a particular way. He said, as I ought to speak. What is the way? Boldly. Paul mentions boldness a second time here, this time to show us that the way we share will either affirm or discredit the message of the gospel. By boldness, he doesn't mean fearlessness, because Paul himself said he preached with sometimes with fear and much trembling and weakness. Rather, he means the absence of politically correct, smooth words. The heroes of the, of the church are not men in soft clothing, but the persecuted John the Baptist. And lastly, 
Did you notice how neither Paul nor the Holy Spirit thought the details of his physical situation were significant enough to be permanently recorded? He wrote a beautiful letter of encouragement to, the, to Ephesus, but never once mentioned the rats, the latrine, the uh, musty chill. He does want them to know these details, but he leaves them for Tychicus to relate. The primary message we carry to you from the persecuted church is the message that they are being persecuted for, the good news of Jesus. And yet, I am secondarily a Tychicus of sorts to tell you of their physical needs. This is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 